Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this afternoon's presentation with Andrew Jampoler, Lost in the Ice. My name is Nora Schneider. I am the Library Genealogy Associate here at Thomas Welch Library. We are thrilled to have you with us. I'm going to hand things over to Andrew Jampoler so that he can get started with this very interesting presentation that we have for you this afternoon. Andrew, are you ready to get started? All set. And uh, good afternoon to you who are watching. We're going to be talking about a fascinating event in 1918, uh, Lost in the Ice. But before we get to that story, sea story, uh, we'll be talking about some other things. And, and here they come. Why is it not advancing? OK. Uh, just for background, this is the third of a series of lectures that we've done at the Balls Library. Uh, the first about the Greeley Expedition in Arctic Canada. Voyage to an Enchanted Land was a talk about the Herndon Expedition in the mid 19th century in a dugout canoe down the full length of the Amazon. And today we'll be talking about the disappearance of the light ship, light vessel cross rip in 1918. Let's begin uh, way back uh, with uh, the fisheries and the Grand Banks. In the 15th century, in the early 15th century, Basque and Portuguese fishermen found the Grand Banks off Newfoundland, and they found that they were an enormously rich fishery. Uh, cod and uh, all sorts of other fish teeming there, and these became enormously important food stock for Europe uh, the cod were either dried or the fish were either dried ashore or salted using Portuguese salt. And they played an enormous part in feeding Europe uh, during that century. Uh, they came to the attention of Northern Europeans, the English specifically, when John Cabot, sailing for Henry VII in 1497, came across the Grand Banks, across Newfoundland, and discovered uh, for those Northern Europeans the riches of that fishery. On the left, there's some indications of, of advertising, uh, not of the period, of the later period, for fish companies and for the most important, or one of the most important ingredients of this uh, uh, industry, uh, salt. The fish either had to be dried or salted to be preserved. We don't focus anymore on the enormous importance of fish as a food stock. Normally, what people focus on is the development of agriculture or herding and, uh, and uh, those dimensions of agriculture. The reality is much of the protein of Europe in the historic times was codfish and other fish caught. This is uh, some illustrations of the richness of the fisheries from uh, a book published in 1855, A History of the Scandinavian Peoples. And you get some idea of the imagery that shows the richness of these fisheries and the part that they played. That fishery has collapsed. In about 1992, it became clear that the Grand Banks were no longer able to sustain the level of fishing that had been pursued for centuries. And that collapse of that fishery is well described in a number of books. Uh, during the course of this talk, I'll mention some books to you. Uh, they're also on, listed on my website and I can recommend them uh, to you if the subject interests you. Uh, the Mortal Sea, Fishing the Atlantic in the Age of Sail, and Cod by Mark Kurlansky are the two I would point out to you specifically. But this is a part of, of our history, of our common humanities history, that needs some attention because uh, it is going away. Those fisheries have been, as I said, overfished and abused. And like many other things we see in the degradation of our environment, the disappearance of these stocks is a part of uh, economic abuse and scientific misunderstanding of what was occurring. Beyond the fishery as a food stock, there was another very important fishery on the U.S. Atlantic coast, uh, and that fishery was for whales. Its uh, center was in Nantucket. We'll talk a lot about Nantucket in a moment. But the reasons for this very aggressive a pursuit of whales were different. It was not foodstuffs, uh, but energy. Whale blubber converted to oil, uh, burned for illumination and, and other purposes as well. 
the result was a very aggressive pursuit of right whales and other whales in an effort to capture them, skin them, uh, and burn their, uh, uh, reduce their fat to oil and burn that oil for energy and for lighting. There are a number of really good books on the subject. One of my favorites is by, called Leviathan by Eric J. Dolan, but there are many others. The newest, and I have not read it, uh, by Skip Finley, is called Whaling Captains of Color, which is a very different look at the whaling fishery whose heart in the United States was on the island of Nantucket. More than simply whales were being extracted from uh, the oceans. Uh, this wonderful painting in the Rijksmuseum shows you that fishery in the Bering Sea, uh, the pursuit of whales, but you'll also see abusing polar bears, a colorful painting, uh, walruses and seals, and seals were another fishery uh, that was attracted uh, sailors for as long as they possibly could until that fishery collapsed too. There's a book called The War Against the Seals that tells you that. Obviously, seals, the, the goal was their fur, not their fat or their uh, them as a food stock. That fur was precious because it was so thick and rich and uh, elegant, uh, it became a fashion statement to wear them. The heart of the American whale fishery was the island of Nantucket, uh, 20 some odd miles offshore from uh, the Massachusetts coast. Nantucket means the faraway land in the native Indian dialect. Uh, this is an aerial photograph of the island of Nantucket. And here is an 1881 engraving of the island looking over the principal city, uh, also named Nantucket. Nantucket's first British proprietors, first English-speaking proprietors, arrived there in 1659. Uh, it was purchased uh, from one hand to the other by uh, a small payment of money and two beaver skin hats, uh, which must be one of the great real estate deals of, of ever, uh, of the epoch. Uh, this uh, view of Nantucket doesn't show you the railroad that was built a few years later that connected the principal town, also named Nantucket, uh, with one of the more distant towns. The population of Nantucket uh, ran from, uh, in the 18, 1800s, about 5,600 people. The last census, the 2020 census, showed a, a little over 14,000. And you'll see the population rise and fall in this graph uh, over time. Uh, the height of the fishery was 9,000 or so, the whale fishery was 9,000 or so. It then progressively collapses until the restoration of the island's population driven largely by tourism. And you'll see that starting in, in the 60s, uh, upticks uh, after that uh, in the 80s uh, and into the century. The whaling fishery created not simply a source of energy, uh, but also uh, fascinating literature. One of the very earliest stories, one of the earliest pieces of this literature, uh, appearing in uh, 1839, was a book called Mocha Dick, or the White Whale of the Pacific. There was, in fact, a white whale uh, offshore of Chile uh, in this era. And uh, this book jacket shows you that story by J.M. Reynolds. That's Reynolds up there in the top right. A story of a white whale that uh, swam offshore in Chile, central Chile, and became a part of the legends of the whaling industry. And there have been albino whales since then as well. They're rare, as you might suspect, but uh, appear frequently enough to know that the truth uh, is the, in the story of Mocha Dick, the white whale of the Pacific. That story will be picked up several times. Uh, the most famous is uh, Moby Dick, Herman Melville. We'll talk about him in a moment. But let's begin back a little bit with the whale ship Essex. That ship was in fact uh, rammed in November 1820 by a whale in the mid Pacific and sunk as a consequence of this ramming, throwing the crew into their boats. And over the course of the next miserable months, uh, members of the crew died, resorted to cannibalism, and a few survived in a horrific story and it is described brilliantly by Nathaniel Philbrick 
in the heart of the sea, it became a movie of the same story, the story of the ramming of the ship Essex and the suffering of the subsequent crew. Uh, that true story becomes fiction, slowly. Uh, it becomes fiction in the hands of Herman Melville. You see his dates there. In 1851, Melville publishes, and this is not his first book. He's written a couple because he was a whaler himself. Melville publishes Moby Dick or the, or the White Whale, the whale. Uh, there's a picture of uh, one of the book jackets uh, with a foreword by Philbrick. Philbrick is a superb author. I commend to you pretty much anything he's written. Uh, he is a resident of, of Nantucket, although not a native. He arrived in Nantucket as an adult and has been writing sea stories ever since. And I admire, as I suggested to you, I admire all of them. In any case, the whaling industry then is uh, an important feature of the economic life of the country because it, the, the flesh, not the flesh, the fat uh, reduced to oil provides illumination and replacement of candles. It's not, that's not forever. In 1859 in Titusville, Pennsylvania, oil is discovered. We have used candles and whale oil and uh, coal oil for lighting uh, before then, but in 1859, Oil is discovered in the ground in Titusville. And there are two pictures here that I want to focus you on. The left one is the single well in Titusville. The one on the right, just a few years later, shows you the extent to which the discovery of oil has exploded as an industrial commodity. Look at all those derricks. Look at all those towers bringing oil up out of the ground to be a power source uh, right, uh, right into our century, obviously. And the result of this will be to remove the emphasis on whaling as an industry, whaling as an occupation. But it's just as well that that has happened because the population of whales begins to collapse anyway, slowly. And after the Civil War, as a part of the Civil War, the Union whaling fleet is destroyed by Confederate commerce raiders up in the Bering Sea. And the destruction of this whale and fleet signals uh, and parallels the discovery of, uh, of oil soon thereafter. So uh, it's a switch from one source of energy to another source of energy. The United States naturally uh, focuses on the sea because for, for the longest period in our history, we were essentially a coastal country. Uh, that focus has to do with navigation. It has to do with uh, the development of ports, the development of ships, easy to do in this country because great forests lying up on rivers, the wood is floated down to shipyards and they're very easily built uh, a great merchant navy and a great uh, uh, navy per uh, period uh, as a consequence of the geography of the country. What the, these economic and other pressures do is they result in a determination to figure out how best to exploit the sea. And that means how best to use it as, surface, as a surface for transportation, as a source of food and, and other things. One of the questions, not, not simply uh, having to do with the building of ships, for instance, one of the questions becomes how to operate uh, a mer merchant marine and a navy safely. And, and this is a cartoon the, from 1877 that shows Uncle Sam looking at the wreck of a shipwreck and musing about how there has to be some development of life-saving services to uh, make it possible to continue the level of use of the sea uh, that uh, has been clearly developing. This cartoon shows a very reluctant Uncle Sam thinking about, okay, I've got to do something about the deaths and destruction. And the result is the creation of a number of institutions. One of those institutions was the life-saving service. These are stations of that life-saving service. And the illustration on the bottom right shows you a lifeboat being pulled by its crew, getting ready to launch into the waters to rescue uh, the members, uh, the passengers, the crew members of a ship suffering shipwreck. So these illustrations show you that aspect, that development. Some more pictures, the launch of a life-saving crew in the right, 
another uh, view of, of a small boat in the left also heading out on a mission. Difficult to do in the face of the stormy weather that uh, necessarily accompanied a lot of shipwrecks. This is another feature of the development of safe uh, marine travel, and that is shore stations, lighthouses, and ranges, light ranges, that help uh, safety near shore. Uh, the uh, purpose of the lighthouse is obvious. The purpose of the range, the bottom picture, for instance, shows you two buildings. When lined up at sea, the lights from the one building and the other behind it show you a bearing line, and that safe bearing line is an indication of where to sail, where to steam, to move into a harbor. So these are parts of the uh, infrastructure development that would necessarily accompany the growth of, of use of the sea by the new country. One of the fascinating technological developments of the pressure to find a way to rescue sailors and extremists close to shore was the development of the Francis lifeboat. This is a patent drawing from Francis's uh, uh, lifeboat patent application. He lived between 1801 and 1893, and one of his boats is in the collection of the Smithsonian. Francis developed a lifeboat that could be pressed out of metal in parts, very safe, uh, very well designed, and it could be brought out to a wreck by firing a gun, dragging a line. That line could then be used to guide the lifeboat out to the ship in extremis, out to the ship in distress. This is the hydraulic press that Francis developed that stamped out one half of his lifeboat at a time. And he produced from that the Francis patented metallic life car. In there, they would shoot a line out to the ship. That line would then permit the vessel in distress to tow out the life car to it. Four members of the crew or four passengers could lie down inside of that life car and it could be towed back to shore to rescue those four and sent back out to get some more. These were really clever boats, uh, clever enough that the U.S. Navy in the 1848 expedition to the Dead Sea used the Francis life car to go onto the Sea of Galilee, down the Jordan River, and to conduct extensive scientific observations of the Dead Sea, all this done in two issue two editions of the life car. The other pro many other problems, but one of the other problems in inshore navigation or close to shore navigation was knowing exactly, exactly where you were with respect to channels, with respect to shallows and other dangers. And the solution to this problem was to position light vessels out on top of the reefs at the shallows at the key navigation points offshore. And these vessels acted as floating lighthouses or floating markers to assist arriving and departing ships as they approached or left the US coast. Here are some of the famous ones, the Ambrose Channel, the Nantucket Lights. Uh, we'll talk a lot about this because this is the heart of the story that I'll be telling you what happened to one of those life vessels some interior photographs and they're a little bit misleading. Uh, they're misleading because not all light, light vessels had the power to move. Most of them were nothing more than floating lighthouses anchored in place on a reef on some shallows at an intersection and they floated there with nothing else uh, except a small crew taking care of the light on the tallest mast. Uh, here's a representation of one of those lights. It's the title slide that we used. This is the United States Coastal Pilot. It shows you the waters off of Cape Cod, the Nantucket Sound, and that intensely busy body of water between Boston and the city of New York. This region had the most light vessels in it because its navigation was enormously complex and the possibility of running aground and wrecking your vessel was very, very high. 
it's difficult for us to understand the problem represented that this chart is a solution to because today if you pick up your telephone press one of its keys it will tell you down to a couple of decimal points your latitude and longitude and it will tell you as well your elevation all developed through that satellite system orbiting overhead in the era we're talking about navigation was enormously complex it was a process that christopher columbus could have understood and the knowledge of where you were within miles at sea was precious indeed and the knowledge of where you were within much smaller distances near shore was not simply precious but life-saving these waters here were strewn with wrecks and it's for that reason for the difficult navigation in this area for that reason this had the most light vessels of any place along the u.s east coast at the time we're talking about there's an explosion anyway in american transportation and a great thrust to explore to expand to build and to profit it was the people had decided the manifest destiny of americans to expand across the continent and here you see some illustrations of that uh, trucks transporting goods the tremendous expansion of the rail system steamships connecting uh, ports on the american coast within europe and elsewhere and the very beginnings uh, after the turn of the century the very beginnings of aviation the the key system at this time the key domestic transportation system at this time was the railroad and this map 1898 map uh, shows you the threads of railroads running across the continent and look at how rich that system is look at how many lines are, are meeting at the major ports on the east coast and elsewhere are crossing the continent and heading west and tying it together uh, a fascinating map in passing before we move on take a look at the concentration of railroads in the northeastern corner of this map and compare that with a much lesser density of rails in the southeastern corner now this is 1898 it's well past the civil war but what it suggests is how much easier transportation of goods and people was in the northeast than it was in the southeast and it suggests if you think about one of the great disadvantages the south had in the war that it was recently concluded in moving people and moving products across its country the confederacy as compared to the north it's one of the reasons why i think there was no way that the confederacy was going to win the civil war there are many other reasons but that's one of them we'll focus specifically on that northeastern corner and take a look at the tracks across the atlantic liverpool halifax quebec la havre gibraltar and, and points into the mediterranean these are the great port areas and the navigation back and forth into these ports was facilitated by the uh, lighthouses and other aids that we'll be talking about shortly june 28th 1914 archduke franz ferdinand of austria hungary is assassinated at Sarajevo uh, there's a painting of that moment of assassination he and his wife uh, there by Gavro Princip I think was his name uh, a tubercular young revolutionary and that act and the subsequent uh, responses of the uh, of the Empire's concern that act triggers the First World War the literature on the First World War is enormous on my website you'll see uh, some suggested titles uh, here they are uh, all of them are fascinating uh, the sources of that war are, are interesting it was one that was blundered into and it set the stage tragically for the next war this was called the great war but there was a greater one still to come and it was a consequence of how this one played itself out a cartoon of the period uh, shows you that with uh, the Tsar, Tsar Alexander, driving a steamroller into the heart of Europe, it was widely believed that the huge population of Tsarist Russia would have a lot to do with how this played itself out. Uh, there is John Bull launching the, the Royal Navy onto the continent, 
and the various dogs of war barking and snarling at each other in the middle, while down in the bottom right-hand corner, the Ottoman Turk pinches shut the Dardanelles while he's playing with the fleets now closed up in the, in the uh, Black Sea. August the 1st, 1914, Germany declares war. The two, the two empires declare war. It will produce an enormous conflict from which uh, will, be, will grow the seeds of the Second World War. These are posters, recruiting posters, that suggest to you the intensity of that, of that conflict as it will play itself out. You know and I know that it was fought substantially in the Western Front in trenches under horrible uh, conditions, horrific conditions, uh, trenches that essentially ran from the coast uh, to the Swiss border. Uh, these are some illustrations of what that life was like, what that fighting was like. This particular one uh, is, is horrific in its detail. I think it's from the London uh, Museum of War in London. Um, the United States will be finally pulled into that war after a fairly determined effort to avoid participation by several rounds of unrestricted submarine warfare by the Imperial German Navy, most famously the sinking of the Lusitania uh, in, this, uh, in this painting, uh, the 7th of May, 1915. But uh, the trigger will be the repeated resort to unrestricted submarine warfare uh, not so much the destruction to uh, American shipping as the loss of life on, on shipping uh, that victimized by the U-boats. That will set the stage for the decisive event that triggers American participation in the war. Participation is really quite reluctant. For the longest time, uh, the president deliberately avoided involvement. He argued that that was a European war, that we had nothing at risk there and no particular interests. Zimmerman, the foreign secretary in uh, the German government, sends a telegram, a famous encrypted telegram to his ambassador, the German ambassador in Mexico City. And when that telegram is intercepted in Britain, as it was through the uh, submarine uh, cables that passed through Britain, and broken, the code is broken, and here you see it in code, essentially what Zimmerman has proposed is a deal with Mexico. He has asked his ambassador to approach the president of Mexico and to say, join us in the fight against the Americans, uh, and we will share with you the benefits of that, uh, including a recovery of the states you lost to the Americans during the Mexican-American War. And uh, we urge you at the same time to recruit Japan to our side, and we will fight together, we will win together. The Mexicans do a very quick analysis of that offer and conclude there is no way they will benefit from it. And that the United States lies astride their trade, their uh, banking and other things, and there is no way that they will benefit from any sort of a relationship the U.S. is given a translated copy of this by Great Britain, the British, and that will end up being the cause for the United States entering the war, reading that document, April the 6th, 1917. And here's some headlines uh, from the Tacoma Times, one of them, and from a paper called the Broad Axe. I, I, I love their motto, hew to the line, let the chips fall where they may. War has been declared with all of its attending horrors by the United States against the Imperial government of Germany. The recruiting campaign in the United States will parallel the recruiting campaigns uh, that have uh, erupted in the European combatants, uh, famously this particular one, but there will be other posters uh, raising liberty bonds, war, war savings bonds, trying to figure out ways to fund uh, the fight and also to recruit the men that will be necessary in uniform and in civilian life, uh, truckers and others, uh, to make victory possible. The United States will establish for the first time a very large system of training camps for the regular army and for the National Guard. These are the zones 
identifying those training camps. And it is from these camps that trained troops will be shipped to the U.S. East Coast and ultimately shipped uh, to various ports in Europe to join in the fight. I point out to you, just look in the middle at Camp Funston and Fort Riley, because uh, it is here uh, scientists and medical people now believe it is here that the great flu epidemic of 1918 began. Not in Spain, not despite the fact that the flu was called the Spanish flu, but here in the mid middle of the United States, in an area of pig farms, in an area of migrating birds, and who knows, but those suggest the sources of the particular virus. But it is here that that flu will erupt and it will be shipped from here to Europe through the armed forces that are deployed to join the fight. It'll end up being called the Spanish flu because Spain has no censorship in its newspapers in Europe and reports that the king has contracted the flu and this will somehow become attached to Spain rather than to what we believe to have been its original source here in the heartland of the United States. It's interesting now in the context of, of COVID, as we think about it, that it will trigger also something else that is similar to us, and that is rioting in various places against the use of face masks as a preventative for the spreading of this deadly disease that will kill tens of millions. I mentioned to you that it will move to Europe and the rest of the world across the shipping lanes that move American troops from the U.S. East Coast to France and to England. Here's some indication of what those lanes look like through the various ports of departure. And here, this particular example uh, from a newspaper of the period shows that two million moved roughly split equally between uh, port of arrivals in the United Kingdom and ports in France and the Mediterranean. Some illustrations of those uh, troop ships and movement, the assemblies of the troop ships as well. One of the great crises of that war in uh, the Western Hemisphere, in the North American continent, was an explosion in Halifax, December the 6th, 1917. This explosion in the port city of Halifax, the result of a, uh, of a collision between a vessel carrying munitions and a vessel carrying an ordinary cargo, an empty vessel getting ready to carry cargo, in the port of Halifax will be the largest explosion until the, the uh, atomic bomb goes off. And that these are, are local newspaper reports that Halifax death toll will be thousands. Many will be killed. Many more will be blinded because they have been at the port of Halifax watching watching as these two ships collide. SS Emo outbound and empty, heading down to the United States for the load to carry cargo to the war. SS Mont Blanc carrying munitions of various sorts, inbound, heading into the port of Halifax, into the narrows. You see those, those narrows uh, right here, right in this area here. The two ships will collide and explode, Mont Blanc will explode with this enormous blast that will destroy that part of the city, shatter all the windows, kill thousands and blind thousands more who have lined the windows of their buildings to see what was going on in the port. There's a museum in Halifax that models that. There's SS uh, Emo on, uh, on the left coming out. Uh, there's Mont Blanc on the right inbound Emo's navigation through the channel was completely uh, unprofessional. She was in the wrong place, moving at the, at the wrong speed, runs in, the ships explode, burn and explode, and create that great catastrophe. Wonderful book by Laura McDonald called The Curse of the Narrows describes this. Here's some pictures of the Narrows in Halifax after that explosion. And now we'll turn to what we came from. The winter of 1917-1918 was one of the coldest on record. This graph, global average surface temperature, goes up through 2020. It's a modern graph, obviously. It will show you what those average surface temperatures were 
uh, before the 1940s, before the 1950s, and generally uh, they were cold. If you look to the right, you'll see what global warming is about. Take a look at the change in average uh, global surface temperature since uh, the 60s. Say. But the years we want to focus on are 1917 and 1918, historically cold years, and historically cold years in New England as well. Fiercely cold. Among the many problems that the cold engendered, uh, they were worsened by the fact that the United States was suffering at the same time from a coal miner strike and from a railroad strike. The coal miner strike was not relieved. All kinds of laborers were pressed into service as substitute miners. And down here, the bottom picture shows you University of Kansas students getting together to mine coal. Wilson will take over government control of the railroad system uh, to be able to move war material people and coal specifically to the U.S. East Coast deal with this shattering cold winter. Here you see uh, coal stocks in New Jersey. One of the great problems in the U.S. East Coast is the very limited capacity for storing coal. It's essentially stored on the barges that bring it uh, along the river systems uh, to, their, to their terminals. This is specifically a problem in the city of New York which will use, I think the figure is 90 million tons of coal a winter and has no storage capacity at all, except very small bunkers at the bottoms of very few buildings. Coal for New York is, is a commodity that's brought in to be used. It is stored on barges across the river in New Jersey. That port freezes up, the barges cannot move, and New York is plunged into a very serious problem in the winter, as is all of New England. Movement across New England slows in the suffering. In Boston, they're chopping down the trees in the parks of Boston to use them for, for firewood. Focus a little bit on uh, what, I've, what I'm showing you here, which are the waters immediately offshore of Connecticut, Rhode Island, and, uh, and Massachusetts. And specifically in that box uh, centered on uh, Nantucket and just to uh, the east of Martha's Vineyard. This is a great commercial cross crossroads for shipping up and down the U.S. East Coast. And you'll see the number of light ships that dot the, that area. And they do because it is a very perilous area to navigate through because of the shallows. And those light ships mark shoal waters, shallow waters uh, that are dangerous to assist shipping in moving up and down the coast. At the center of that box, is the light ship cross rip. It sits on the cross rip shallows on the cross rip shoal between Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. And like all the other light ships at anchor during this terrible winter, she will be caught, caught in ice and held fast as Nantucket is equally caught in ice and the steamer support that, that feeds Nantucket is frozen in place and Nantucket will will suffer dramatically during that cold winter. Here's a closer view of what you just saw a second ago, Martha's Vineyard to the left, and Nantucket in the bottom, and the shallow waters in light blue and dark blue, uh, the deeper waters were in white, the shallow waters that are marked in many places by those floating light vessels. This is the area we're gonna concentrate on, and another close-up shows you Nantucket Island, uh, the town, and there in the box, the red uh, dotted box in the top left, is the cross rip shoal, those blue shallows. And you'll see the other shoal waters, and they're also protected by light vessels, often protected by light vessels. This is light ship cross rip in 1918. It's a model from a museum, a really pretty little model. It's not completely accurate. The hull was painted red, not black. But otherwise, what you're looking at is a floating lighthouse. It is not self-propelled. They cannot move. Uh, they are simply there in position, a crew of seven typically, in position to keep that light lit. And if they need help, uh, they have no radio either. If they need help, uh, they raise signal flags and hopefully one of the vessels of the light ship service will come to assist them. So this is a model 
of the ship that in that February is sitting at those critical waters. Uh, this is another picture of, of a, a lighthouse ashore now, or just offshore, but behind it is the steamer San Katie, and it is this steamer that steams between Nantucket and the mainland, Woods Hole, uh, bringing food, stock, supplies, and other things. And it is this steamer that often is designed, is as tasked to support the light vessels uh, that are uh, on these various stations that we've just described. The one we're talking about, the specific light vessel we're talking about, was built in 1855 in the Hood Yards, Somerset, Massachusetts. And here's some dimensions, 80 feet long, 120 gross tons. The tower she is supporting uh, in, in 1914 is converted to acetylene gas. Uh, in 1917, she'll be dragged off stationed and repositioned and will be lost in February 1918, the lost in the ice of the title of this talk, and it will be decades before any wreckage is found associated with this vessel. None of her crew will be recovered. The tragedy that affects this light ship is she will be caught in the ice and dragged off her station out to deep water and lost. As I say, it'll be 1933 before any bits and pieces of this reliably float up. There is a picture of her uh, as she was uh, during the period. This is the sixth vessel that manned the cross rip shoals. There'll be a string of them and the only one lost. The, the legend will build up about the loss of the vessel. Oh, this is a, a quick illustration of the density of light vessels, light ship anchorages, in the waters that we're describing south and east of Cape Cod. And as I pointed out a little while ago, the reason there are so many is because look at those shallows, those stippled areas uh, in the white background. Uh, those shallows are, are deadly dangerous, and the navigation techniques of the period were not adequate uh, to be able to steam safely, uh, independently through these waters, and the light vessels were the instruments by which the most dangerous sites were, were identified. This is right here where the arrow is circling. This is where Cross Rip Station was. And down here is the tip of Nantucket. This is as she looked, uh, as the new one looked, uh, the 1914 vessel at that same station. And you see it's much more modern. The vessel we're talking about was uh, nothing more than a, a single floating light powered as it was modified by acetylene. Right in the center, there's the cross rib ship. She will be caught in the ice of this great February, uh, where for three months in New England, the temperature never rises to freezing at any time, up to freezing at any time. She will be caught in the ice and dragged by the ice past the tip of Nantucket and out to sea past the great round shoal light ship. Starts drifting on February 4th east uh, in the moving ice and continues on. On board, she is under the command of Henry Joy, the first mate. The captain of the ship is on leave, usual leave, ashore in Dennis, uh, Massachusetts, and Joy and five other men who ride cross rips light ship stuck in the ice out past through the east past uh, Nantucket out into the open Atlantic and never be seen again. There will be reports that they've been found, they've been saved, they've been taken to New Orleans, things of this sort. But the reality is uh, they'll never be seen again. She will pass the lighthouse at Nantucket, manned by Keeper Grinder. She will pass that lighthouse. Uh, in February, February the 5th, and the legend will appear in the newspapers of the day. And it is this legend that got me onto the story because I was going to write a book about it until I found out that the legend was fiction. The story is that Henry Joy will get off of the light ship as she approaches the lighthouse at the tip of Nantucket, walk across the ice, 
uh, variously described as between three and seven miles long, distant, to the lighthouse where he will ask permission to abandon ship. And that permission, the story goes, the legend goes, will be denied by the keeper. And Joy faithfully and loyally will march back to the ruin of his ship, the wreck of his ship, and ride out to oblivion with the rest of his crew. I read that story uh, some years ago now. I said, wow, what, what a human interest story. What? And I started to research it, and that research is the basis of this talk, only to discover that it's complete fiction. The keeper saw the light vessel going by. He recorded it in his logbook at the lighthouse, but there was no hike ashore by Henry Joy. There was no return under instructions to go keep his light on and, and rejoin his ship. Uh, so that, that piece of fiction still leaves a fascinating story. Uh, here are the uh, those lost on, uh, on that ship and never seen again. 1918 is famous for another reason. We mentioned it briefly in passing uh, in connection with the training camps, and that is the epidemic, the flu epidemic of 1918. Uh, Gina Collada, who writes, uh, or wrote, I think, for one of the news magazines, has written what I think is one of the best books on the flu. It's called The Story of the Great Influenza Pandemic, so on and so forth, on the top right that you see. And if you'll go to my website, I mentioned this to you earlier, uh, you'll you'll see all these book titles uh, repeated if you're interested in any of them. Uh, this flu will kill tens of millions world, uh, extending uh, to all kinds of places. There will be uh, bodies frozen in graves in Alaska, for example. Some of these bodies, we will recover enough evidence of the uh, influenza to have some idea of its nature, of its character, medical character. This, these circles, these lines, show you the progress of the flu, the two bumps, the lethality bumps, and the uh, death rates in, uh, in numbers of causes, death from all causes in various capitals, European and American capitals. Back for a moment uh, to light vessels. Light vessels marked shoal waters. They also marked the entry points or the departure points of the great routes that uh, transatlantic routes that connected uh, the shipping lanes between the United States and Europe. And there was a light vessel that, uh, at Nantucket, uh, which marked the end of the route, uh, the channel into and out of uh, the eastern ports. The light vessel Nantucket, this is a modern vessel. We're talking about 1934 now. She is rammed uh, on May the 14th, 1934, killing seven of the 11 men on board and of course sinking the ship. And the vessel that rams her is a sister ship in the, in the White Star Line, a sister ship to Titanic. Uh, there is a painting uh, of that ramming. The tragedy arises because the light vessel marked the midpoint of the channel right at the entry or exit points on the routes to Europe. And the White Star Liner uh, just smoked into her at cruising speed uh, with the results that I've just described. Being on a light vessel uh, was a dangerous and lonely business. Uh, Crossrip demonstrated one of the dangers, the dangers of weather. Uh, Nantucket demonstrated another, the fact that in fog conditions and poor visibility conditions. The vessels that marked these navigation points were vulnerable to horrific catastrophes. Uh, there are, uh, on the left uh, side of this graphic, I show you the light ships captured in the Civil War, uh, the cross rip lost in the ice, and others sunk by various causes, gunfire, collisions, and, and uh, the bottom one, the 1934 collision of Royal Mail Ship Olympic with uh, Nantucket. The dead of these light vessels have been honored uh, by this bell, 
and a, a monument commemorating their service and uh, commemorating their loss of life in that service uh, over the over the years. And what you see here is that monument erected fairly recently. They did, in fact, decades after uh, Cross Rip disappeared, they did, in fact, find a few bits and pieces of her, including the ship's bell. Uh, and uh, and that's all that was ever discovered, all that we ever got out of that. So that's lost in the ice. I, I know I've thrown a lot at you talking about everything from the flu epidemic to the war uh, and to the development of transportation systems across the North American continent. Uh, I'm grateful for your time and attention. I hope you've enjoyed this in the previous talks. Let me mention to you that there will be uh, three others in the spring, and the dates will be promulgated by the library. Uh, these three uh, will cover uh, slavery and looking specifically at the tragic movement of these suffering peoples from Africa to the to the Western world and uh, what that flow looked like, what its implications were, how it arose, how uh, happily and mercifully it disappeared. Uh, we will also have a conversation, another illustrated lecture on Henry Morton Stanley and the exploration of Africa. Stanley himself is fascinating. The motive behind uh, his mission, the motive behind his exploration, uh, the follow, uh, finding of Dr. Livingston was a newspaper stunt. Uh, he was sponsored uh, by an American journalist who, uh, not a newspaper owner, not a journalist, who thought it would attract readership. He was quite right. It attracted enormous readership on the story has become famous. That's through a dark continent. And uh, also another one on the sort of theme of Africa is the story of the miserable expeditions and the dreadful death of Lieutenant Emery Taunt, United States Navy, who was sent uh, to Africa by the Navy to explore the Congo and to see if there is a commercial poss benefit, commercial possibilities for American manufacturers, for American trade in the heart of the African continent. His uh, explorations uh, will be difficult and painful. Uh, he will return to the continent as the first resident uh, American diplomat, American consul in Central Africa, and he will die there diseased and drunk. A few years later, still a young man, and that story uh, is one of the books I wrote called Congo, The Miserable Expeditions and Dreadful Death of Lieutenant Emery Taunt. So, I'm appreciate uh, your participation in the series to date. I hope the story of Cross Rip embedded in the much larger story of what the teens in America and what the teens in the world were like interested you. I urge you to take a look at the books I've suggested uh, and commend your attention to them. And thank you for joining me. Uh, I look forward to talking to you uh, next time. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat box and we will answer them. I have a question. You mentioned for communication when they were on the light ships, they had to use the signal flags. Was that because there was no other technology available because of how far offshore they were? Or was that just the method that the light ship system had chosen to use at that time? The, the light ships were very austerely equipped and manned. Uh, they had very limited sources of power. They were basically burning acetylene or oil. Uh, there was no communications ashore other than emergency flag hoists. Uh, and uh, the consequence was these people were uh, out there by themselves very much. Uh, it, it, reliable radio communications will come soon but these vessels had no access to that. Uh, I, they're, they're out there afloat on a desert island is what it amounts to. If you picture a, a, a bare hull anchored to great concrete blocks on the sea bottom, uh, bobbing around in the sea and otherwise uh, beyond the light, otherwise incapable of doing much but feeding itself and manually pumping its bilges uh, that's an accurate picture of the 
of the relatively primitive technology that was afloat in the light vessels in that period. And they were using the flags to communicate with ships that were servicing each of the light ships, but were they also using the flags to communicate with other light ships? I, I don't think so. Uh, it's unusual if they were in sight of each other. Uh, and uh, there wasn't a whole lot of communication going on anyway. They were out there on schedules. Uh, they, they were supported by that, that steamer, Fancati, and, and uh, out of Woods Hole by other vessels as well. Woods Hole was the uh, logistic support base for the system uh, in this part of the country. Uh, and essentially, these are guys floating on a chip of wood uh, in, uh, in deep water, or shallow water in their case, near deep water, and uh, left to their own devices. Brave sailors, many of them came from uh, uh, the Cape and, and areas immediately adjacent to it. The crew of Cross Rip came largely from Dennis and Dennis Port. And uh, the research that we did uh, flushing the story out was in that area. Uh, one of the uh, crew houses has been converted into a B&B &B, and Susie and I uh, spent uh, spent a night or two, Susie, a night or two uh, in that B&B, &B, uh, sort of enjoying the ambiance, the sense of, gee, this is where it started. But uh, those crews were very much left to their own devices, uh, other than being supported on a regular schedule by the exchange of personnel and resupply of foodstuffs and things like that. Other questions, other comments? Are we getting anything or shall we just wait? It seems as though this story is just kind of one disaster, one right after the other, after the other. And you mentioned that you got interested in the story of the cross rip when you came across the, the story of um, Joy potentially walking across the ice to the lighthouse that ended up being fiction. How did you go from the, getting interested in that story and then kind of working your way back and connecting all of the disasters together to the ultimate loss of the cross rip? The, this was going to become a book. Uh, it was going to become a book because I thought the idea of somebody uh, leaving his ship caught in the ice at his age, this is an old man, hiking across the ice, heroically returning to his ship and riding it to oblivion. I thought that was a really pretty thrilling uh, piece of drama. Uh, I was deeply disappointed to discover it's absolute fiction. There are a couple of newspapers that carry that fictive story forward. Uh, for, for weeks, uh, just because I think it pumped up readership. But uh, there's there's nothing in any record that suggests there's any truth to that. So I reluctantly gave up on it and uh, and converted the research to, uh, to these graphics and to this conversation. But uh, the men of Dennisport, uh, uh, play, Dennis and Dennisport played a huge part in these waters because uh, they were their home waters. And uh, they were all sailors for the most part. Uh, and uh, I thought that the life that they lived was fascinating. The story got broader as time went on because uh, the great winter of 1718 was just ferocious. And we don't think much about it. And as I did the research, the coal strike, the suffering uh, in the big cities where they were unable to get coal, unable to be warm warm themselves to the point where they're chopping down trees in the park, I thought was was an astonishing situation. And uh, it's just a hundred years ago. He said, talk about dramatic change. Look at how we live life today as compared to what was going on then. The Kansas football team shoveling for coal in the face of a coal strike. The president nationalizing railroads to be able to move them to where he wanted to move them. The creation of the Railway Express Agency. Uh, if you're my age, uh, you went to summer camp and your trunk was shipped to your camp on the Railway Express Agency's cars. And, and that agency grew out of the coal catastrophe a particular winter. And it's fun to kind of think about these things. Okay. You've, you've mentioned Woods Hole a couple of times. Besides its geographic location, 
uh, to Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket. Is there anything else about Woods Hole that makes it ideal for the logistical headquarters for the light ships? It's not simply the logistical headquarters. It has become uh, one of the research headquarters for oceanography uh, uh, in the United States and, and has enormous status in that connection. But its location, its access to shipping lanes, its, uh, its access to open water, I think is why uh, it's there. I don't pretend to know the history, the origins of the place, but it is an absolutely famous research facility, oceanographic research facility. And I think it's uh, over time, its location is what drove that, uh, what drove that attracting the uh, scholars from neighboring universities and things like this. And it has significant connections to the wreck of the Titanic as well, which you mentioned because of the sister ship Olympia. Mm -hmm. Um, because the scientist that discovered the wreck of Titanic was based out of Woods Hole. Well, I mean, it's a, so it all comes full circle. <laughs> yeah, it's a great scientific resource, and uh, and we can talk about Titanic sometime too. That'd be fun. Yeah. Uh, that as an important dimension of that is the notion of of lifeboats on ships. And very casual approach to lifeboats on ships until after the wreck of the Titanic. It was interesting to hear how many significant historical ships and historical events were connected to the light ship system off of the coast of New England at that time. Absolutely. Absolutely. This this system was the key navigation aid. I I'm struck by I I spent a year as a air crew navigator. I hated it. Uh and I spent a lot of time thinking about navigation as a plane commander in, in later life. And it's astonishing how we take for granted the notion of knowing where we are. Uh, I, I meant that. I said a, a little while ago, you press a button on your phone and you know where you are within yards and your elevation to the foot. Uh, that kind of knowledge was simply unavailable until fairly recently. I mean, if you took a star shot as, as as good as you could be as a celestial navigator, you're down to three, five miles. Uh, now, if you don't know where you are within a yard, you feel offended. You know, somebody is, is misleading or deceiving you. The light ships were a very early and, for the most part, very successful effort to mark dangerous waters or certain points in the entry and exit system of, of maritime navigation. Uh, and uh, those crews faced, to my mind, stunning boredom, hard and thankless work, I suspect very poor pay and some horrific weather. And all that came together at the Cross Rip Shallows, Cross Rip Shoal, that, uh, that winter, that miserable winter, for weeks, the temperature never even got to freezing. It was below freezing for weeks. Uh, the situation, food situation on uh, on the island on Nantucket got very serious. And finally, San Caddy shows up uh, uh, getting help to get there and relieves that. But uh, much too late uh, to do anything for the light ship cross road. Well, thank you for a wonderful presentation and thank you for joining us today. And thank you everyone else for joining us today and we hope you enjoyed it and have a great rest of your day. I, I appreciate the opportunity to tell a story that has interested me for a long time. Thank you for your technical support and uh, cooperative spirit. You're very All welcome. Right. Have a great rest of your day.